Greetings, everyone. Um, my name is Gary Belkin. Uh, welcome to our session on the intersections of climate change and mental health. Um, it's really great to be bringing this topic into this um, global reach conference. Um, and uh, we're we have I have with me a, a, a wonderful group of um, co-conspirators in um, bringing attention to these intersections. Um, and um, we're going to talk about uh, not just the mental health impacts of climate change, but also how thinking about addressing those impacts uh, gets to a big theme of this whole conference, which are the many social intersections of mental health, both um, as an impact, but also as an engine of social progress and strengthening. Um, and um, I think I'm feeling a global tide of movement towards mental health work really mostly being about social spaces and strengthening. Um, and um, I think uh, we can feel that energy in um, uh, the intersection with climate change. Uh, so briefly, you're going to hear a bit from me, Gary Belkin. Um, I'm a psychiatrist, uh, but I've done mostly public health work. I was mental health commissioner for New York City for a while, and I'll focus on climate change and mental health. Um, and um, uh, I'm honored to chair a new organization or network of organizations, which I'll just describe a bit more of, called Cop Squared. Um, after I do that, um, you'll hear from um, Sandeep Maharaj, who uh, I've gotten to know um, uh, in his many hats, one of which is really our anchor for the Caribbean region in the Cop Square network. Um, but he also does a lot of other things. Um, he's a senior lecturer in the School of Pharmacy at the University of West Indies and also the associate dean. Uh, for distance education planning and the director of entrepreneurship and business transformation for uh, the faculty of medical science at the University of West Indies St. Augustine. Um, he's also a, a real figure both in the region but also globally in uh, the Planetary Health Alliance and the Planetary Health Movement. Um, and uh, then uh, you'll be hearing from Jan Kress. Um, Nika uh, Saidi was um, intending to come, but I think Jan's going to pick up the baton from her. Um, they are both uh, coming from uh, UNDP. Jan works for the Global Preventing Violent Extremism, or PVE team, of the Conflict Prevention, Peacebuilding, Responsive Institutions team. A lot of nested teams, which is fabulous, in UNDP's Crisis Bureau. Um, he's a program analyst, and he uh, particularly looks at the um, mental health and psychosocial services um, portfolio. So we're going to go in that sequence and hopefully have time to um, look at uh, and take questions, look at the chat, and um, um, hear what you're thinking. Um, so I'll get started and tell you a bit about COP Squared. Um, um, so COP Squared stands for Care of People Times Planet. Um, really, the message there being that um, we need to care for people to really exponentially elevate the um, power, bandwidth, and potential to care for the planet adequately. We need um, resilient people for resilient places. We need empowered people for nurtured environments. So um, we uh, formed a, a network that I'll describe a bit more, but um, it was really in response to a number of things. Next slide. One is in the last couple, in the last couple of years, uh, there's just been real um, growth in evidence about the many mental health impacts uh, at both individual and population levels of climate events, whether it's discrete adverse um, weather events, hurricanes, um, storms, flooding, um, heat waves, um, which uh, can then be chronic and ongoing and thus have secondary um, ramifying effects like uh, drought and food and economic precarity and um, displacement and migration and so forth and just making everything worse that is bad um, in terms of social determinants of mental health. And so all of those things I mentioned, all those ways that climate is increasingly um, oppressing and pressuring uh, the 
tensions uh, of uh, social care systems and, and and other subsistence systems globally, all of those pressures are just markedly elevating the mental health burden. Um, increased uh, rates of mental illness, depression, anxiety, substance use, suicide, um, uh, trauma, um, all uh, sub, uh, all elevated. And um, that uh, poses, among other things, a real necessity for the mental health field to reimagine how we get care at great scale and deep reach. Um, and I'll talk a, a little bit about that. And but there's so there's this care agenda. How do we really rethink care? But there's also another um, agenda. Next slide, which is the cumulative total of that um, uh, mental health burden is increasingly being looked at for what this does to um, societies, to whole communities, so that the public health concern is not just a lot more people in distress um, that our systems just can't handle, but also um, a lot more communities um, unable to sustain the, or more challenged to sustain the social fabrics, collective efficacy, uh, social strengths, um, to do things, to solve problems together and to uh, manage change together um, and to trust each other. Um, and I think we saw a lot of that connection between individual mental health effects writ large and social impacts and uh, failures writ large in the in the um, COVID epidemic. And um, climate change will just be an even more intense multiplier of those social impacts. And so I think it also challenges us in the mental health field to think about um, how do we contribute with many other sectors and again, a, re a repeating theme in this conference, um, how does mental health tools and knowledge grow overall psychological strengths of communities and systems? To think of um, mental well-being, emotional well-being, mental health, that whole range of, of ways of addressing these things and, and aims, uh, how do we make those really work as resources, as human capital resources, psychological resources? And so uh, there's been a proliferation of ways of thinking about that um, um, from trying to specify very specific attributes, psychological attributes uh, that are uh, needed to be not just good carers and to relieve distress, but to also be good change makers and drive change. Um, efforts like the interdevelopment goals globally, um, shifted mindsets on reciprocity and interactions and um, um, uh, uh, mutual responsivity and um, um, uh, all of the kinds of uh, psychological equipment we need to be change makers. So um, this, next slide. So this kind of um, mutually reinforcing cycle that we wanna get to of mental health in the more care sense of reducing distress and suffering and illness, but also um, psychological resilience in the change sense, um, that these two, I think in the climate space become highly mutually independent and reinforcing and increasingly so, that it's hard to do just the care part without it um, helping fuel change. It's hard to do the change work uh, without also being emotionally supported and having those kind of support systems. So we think, we at COP Squared, as represented by just one snapshot from our website, um, to get you a flavor of the range of organizations that resonate with this very large picture of what we mean by climate and mental health, that it really is this care and change breadth. And how do we bring our tools and capabilities and ground presence in the multiple ways we have that you know, through civil society, health and mental health systems, all, all along the gamut, um, to do both those things in mutually reinforcing ways. Um, and we actually know a fair bit um, how to do that. I um, learned how to do that kind of um, really reimagine how to spread the work of mental health. Next slide. Um, we're working in the, in the global south and what really became a um, growing field of global mental health. Um, and one of the backbone ideas of that was that um, to build out an evidence base and then apply at a great scale, 
that most of the skills that we have reserved for mental health prof professionals to do that range of stuff, what, what I put under the notion of what we mean by psychological resilience, that whole spectrum from care to change, um, and then psychological building blocks for those, um, that whole range of stuff we've often relied on um, specialized systems or institutions or practitioners, et cetera, to do, but that most of them can be done by anybody. Um, and some of these examples of that literature talk about, you know, from the severe end of, uh, you know, very acute sy symptoms, severe depression, let's say, end of the care spectrum of tool and capacity building to the other range of change making capability. Um, there's a good summary here. And I hope you can get these slides. I don't know if you do that, but you can reach, reach me and I'll give you my email at the end uh, for these slides. But these are some really good um, representative pieces of the literature, if you're not familiar. But this uh, paper near the bottom about um, the evolution of nurturing societies that really distills what we know from the mental health prevention and promotion literature that translates into this kind of psychological strengthening that not only um, is good pr protective factors in facing um in, in preventing um uh mental illness in the face of these stressors but in also promoting psychological strengths and change making strengths not just of people but of whole communities so we know enough to do that whole spectrum and we know ways to deliver it and put it in other people's hands and so it's really a matter of political will and thinking about how to create the infrastructures to really scale and make that way of doing this stuff the new normal. So it's not a great NGO here or there, but it is the way that it is done. And uh, the outsized crisis of the climate crisis and its ever presence across the globe really requires thinking in that mainstreaming uh, new normal sort of uh, way. How do we build the social infrastructures? How do we leverage existing health, mental health, other civil society uh, systems to create the um, infrastructure to do psychological resilience building in this in this way. Um, and then the last slide, uh, next slide, sorry. I put that sort of approach to work um, in New York City when I was mental health commissioner. This is a map of New York City with some dots. Uh, each of these dots is a place, a job training program, a daycare center, um, a, a community center, um, uh, a, a, um, um, a, a faith community, a house of worship, um, a, a, a center for homeless people who are homeless. Those array of places, we skilled up the folks who were the front lines and worked there to be the implementers of both care and strengthening um, tools um, in their communities. And uh, so it is scalable, it is doable, we know how to do it. To me, it's about creating the infrastructures that can replicate these kind of maps, this changing real estate of psychological resilience building uh, that is very multiple sector, sectoral and community building just by the fact of relocating it in community spaces. Um, how do we make maps like these the new normal? So uh, next slide. So that is the opportunity we have to show how to do that within the context of really climate affected areas with the race resilience, which is really now a focus of, of COP Square to figure out. Um, for those who are not familiar with the race resilience, this is a UN-led UN effort um, to really mobilize global action to build capacity for climate adaptation in the highest affected regions of the world by 2030, where 4 billion people live. So no lack of ambition. Um, and uh, COP's uh, race resilience has in the Sharm El Sheikh adaptation agenda, which is sort of the launch of their strategic vision and key milestones, um, kind of divided up the systems uh, that need resilient to be more, made more resilient um, of these six systems. You know, so food and agriculture systems, water systems, human settlement systems, and so on that you see here. Um, so they have organized key partners and then their partners so there are hundreds and I don't know, maybe thousands of partners globally involved in um, really trying to amass um, effort uh, to grow local capacity for making these systems more resilient. Again, it is more physical infrastructure. Um, it is more um, you know, built stuff. Um, and we made the argument to the race resilience, you, you need resilient people 
to sustain resilient systems. And so the race resilience should also include the goal of growing capacity um, uh, for psychological resilience um, at the same, the same pace and, and goal to, to benefit the lives of 4 billion people by 2030. And so we are developing a strategic plan, what we're calling a roadmap of how the race resilience partners can do that. And so that's really key, how the race resilience partners can do that. So these already existing efforts, um, this ensemble of already existing partners and mobilized communities to do climate adaptation work, how do we show that across that um, diversity, the work of psychological resilience can be channeled and incorporated within that other work? And I think that is really pushing the envelope of the things we've shown we know how to do. We can put these skills in other people's hands. How do we um, do that and make that the new normal that, that climate adaptation work includes the opportunity to also be channels of psychological resilience work and really get to those mutually reinforcing cycles of emotional support and um, um, connections for change. Um, so um, we plan not only to launch this report at COP, but also an ensemble of early adopters, race resilience partners who are indeed enacting the report, who are actually absorbing that work of psychological resilience. And we wanna do that within um, partners from each of these six systems to show the versatility of the work of psychological resilience, especially when you do it in this ground game sort of way, that it can really be um, customized to each of these kind of settings, contexts, purposes, um, communities. Um, I'll leave you with two examples and then I'll stop. One is sort of a micro effort, um, for example, in the human settlement system, such as all housing. We're working with a key anchor partner there, the Slum Dwellers International, which is in over 20 countries um, and um, uh, working to organize um, informal settlement residents uh, through very co-creative and participatory processes to design and implement and lead and advocate for upgrades to their community infrastructure. Um, we will harness the energy and the readiness of that civic muscle to also adopt, distribute, dis and disseminate and, um, and use um, skills that help youth is their first, fo first focus um, to lead peer-led um, emotional support groups in their community. Um, so it's a very ground game sort of approach, sort of like that map I, I, did, I showed you. But then you have one of these other systems, uh, these one of the cross-cutting enabler systems of finance. And we have interest from potential finance partners in the race resilience. We're thinking about, okay, how do we build finance mechanisms and incentives and, and value the benefits of investing in climate adaptation in tangible ways that can drive how insurance plans are made, how um, um, international development works to put, shift more resources into this kind of work. And one of the things that a subgroup of those are interested in looking at is can we develop ways of valuing emotional uh, strengthening, psychological strengthening, or emotional and psychological losses and damage um, in, in that mix of how we value um, both where we should make climate investments and the benefit we get out of them. Um, so very micro and macro, structural and on the ground uh, sorts of approaches, but that is the versatility I think we need to step up and deliver and create the support systems and the partnerships that, again, make that the new normal. So um, I'll uh, stop with there. Um, our COP Squared network, um, to go from these early adopter waves to then spread regionally and create more networks of partners that can pick up where the early adopters start for scale is going to really depend on us growing out regional hub networks. Um, and Sandeep among, as I mentioned, other things is uh, a key partner for us um, in the Caribbean hub region and he'll, talk a bit more about that, but also in more broadly what he's also doing at this intersection of climate change and mental health. So Sandeep, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Gary, for that very enlightening uh, presentation. And I must admit, I also learned a lot. So thanks again, Gary, for that. Um, so could I move on to the next slide, please? Thanks. So the Caribbean region, we are looking to create something called the Caribbean Living Health Labs. And what does a living health lab do? Um, basically, it brings together actors from the private sector, knowledge institutions, public institutions, 
and users of the system to create a real life context and intervention to ensure at the end of the day, we are making the correct interventions required. Next, next slide, thanks. And in doing this, we look at the planetary health lens um, in, in, in developing this mental. And if you look at the planetary health lens, it looks at the underlying drivers. As you all know, the world by 2050 is expected to have approximately 10 billion people. And can our planet sustain this? And to ensure that it's sustainable, we recognize that planetary health issues are derived by our consumption, our increase in population, and our utilization of technology. When this goes bad, it leads to climate change, global pollution, biodiversity loss, uh, altered chemical and bio biochemical cycles, land use issues, as well as resource scarcities. And that in turn, lead to air quality problems, food production issues, infectious diseases, et cetera, which if not managed well, have some significant health effects. Malnutrition, infectious disease, non-communicable disease, displacement and conflicts. But most importantly, what we are dealing with in the conference here today, one that is called mental health. And the mental health challenges, as if anybody can take a look, you will see it's across the board on each and every level, you will have a mental health challenge. And, and hence, we need to look deeply and get solutions to these issues quickly. Next slide, please. And the Caribbean region is a special region. And as we move on to the next slide, I will show you why this is a special region. The, in the Caribbean region, it was built out of a legacy of slavery and indentureship. And in turn, the economic gains of slavery and indentureship actually fueled the Industrial Revolution in the United Kingdom, which led to the start of the anthropogenic age. And what a lot of people do not understand, the equity and justice issues that this has caused because people were enslaved to really deal with the impacts of their uh, enslavement in the future, where future generations now in the Caribbean where we live are actually dealing with climatic issues, which was not even derived in the Caribbean. The money fueled the, the Industrial Revolution. However, it actually is, we are feeling the effects so we got it on both ends, slavery and climate change, but we need to do something about this. So let's go ahead. Enough of the complaining. Uh, next slide, please. So what we did, we created the Planetary Health Regional Hub, which entails a number of universities. The University of Belize, the University of Guyana, the Uni University of the West Indies, the Anton Decom University of Suriname, the Pan American Health Organization, the George Allen Chronic Disease Research Center in Barbados, and the Caribbean Center for Health Systems Development and Policy. So we brought the core institutions that are government institutions together in a community of practice to start dealing with the planetary health problems, the justice problems, and equality problems that we deal with. Next slide, please. And basically, we wish to build an active collaborative interdisciplinary planetary health community of practice to inspire, and that's why I'm here, really to inspire and guide Caribbean people uh, to tend to protect ecosystems through policies, programs, and sustainable regenerative outcomes. Next slide. And what we then did, we did a mapping of, of, of Caribbean health institutes in the country. We have actually in process of developing a MOOC and we have done a number of surveys. But as we move forward, you'll see the most important thing we have done and the some of the most important work. Next slide. It's the survey approach that we took when it came to Caribbean climate cares, where we surveyed three countries, Guyana, um, Trinidad, Guyana, and Barbados, to look at the Im mental health impacts of COVID-19, as well as climate change, on the youth and the demographies are there. You can see 
there are some biases. However, the important finding from this survey, as we move to the next slide, please, Haley, you will understand that we found approximately 45% of the youth within this region self-reported a history of mental health conditions. And this was no way variable from the literature, literature as UNICEF as well in 2021 found similar levels of, um, of problems. And as I said, there were some biases. There, there were more women than men in the study, as well as persons of higher education level as we move forward. Thanks. So what we then decided to do was get involved in something called the Global Dialogues for Mental Health, which is run by Imperial College, funded by the Wellcome Trust. And in this, we are currently in the process of developing a regional community for the Caribbean region and Latin America as one, whereby we are taking co-conveners, the Latin American Caribbean uh, Center of UWI is the convener and it's taking co-conveners from across Latin America and together with UWI from the uh, Caribbean. And we are appointing youth ambassadors, lived experience persons and expert stakeholders group to develop a dialogue on how and what has been the impact of climate change on mental health within the Caribbean and Latin American region, coming out with approximately three case studies and some further information on how interventions can happen. Next slide, please. And in this dialogue, we intend to have researchers, community groups, policymakers, practitioners, and funders at the table. It's the only way that meaningful change can happen. But we are always thinking of the future. And remember, when you're talking about the living lab, there must be users. So there are lived experience group guiding this, and there are also youth ambassadors who will help us in developing the future plans. As we move to the next slide here. But more importantly, being part of this dialogue is currently the present. Where do we go in the next six months? This is where we intend to go in the next six months. We, in, as the dialogues come to an end, we intend to create impact, impact in the Caribbean. Where do we want to create this impact? Well, we intend to create the impact at the levels of the community, national and regional uh, practitioners, as well as national and regional stakeholders when it comes to policymakers and political decision makers within the Caribbean. This impact we expect to be done via a knowledge generation and translation process where we'll be scoping reviews, country-based case studies, regional youth surveys to be done, regional surveys on mental health and their professionals, as well as knowledge synthesis that we expect to put together over a period of time that will then drive the country-based sustainable interventions, the regional training workshop for mental health professionals, and also develop a national stakeholder dialogue um, to do three main things, improve youth education and action, develop professional capacity building, and finally create significant political intervention and advocacy. All of that is anchored and pillared against a strong, robust communication plan that is being developed together with the, you know, the Caribbean is known for reggae, calypso, soca. Most of the leading artists within the Caribbean so we can get that level of buy-in connection, community connection. And Gary speaks about how do we get action one of the main ways to get action is to get buy-in and commitment to this moving forward. And hence, we get the public sensitization advocacy. We expect at the end of this to increase visibility of climate change as related to youth and mental health, improve the current status of climate health practitioners and the ability to deliver on mental health issues across the Caribbean, and finally, be able to put 
policy briefs to drive change in climate health policy and to include mental health issues across the board when decision makers and policy makers go to the table. And we have developed a slogan that we intend to put forward, mental health in every policy. They speak about uh, health in every policy, mental health post the COVID dynamic. We recognize people, place, and purpose is the only way to regenerate and sustain these economies going forward, as well as afford a better level of life, living, and creating equity and justice across the Caribbean. There, Gary, I, tend, I wish to end my speech two minutes early to give the more interesting presenters more time. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you're too modest, Sandeep. Uh, thank you. Um, and I, I turn to uh, you now, uh, Jan, and, and also um, talk about intersectionality. I mean, the work that you're, you're all doing and um, in this work. Thank you very much, Terry and Sandeep, for um, bidding us uh, having some some space to talk about that, but also for the two extra minutes. Thank you, Sandeep. Um, I don't think that's that's we will, we will match your your intervention, but I will try. Um, so thank you very much once again. Um, we have here at the Crisis Bureau of UNDP a slightly different approach to it. I think that would be a very good complementary. Um, discussion that we can have afterwards. And I'd be very happy both um, Gary, Sandeep, and to the participants to have questions, comments on, on um, the approach that I'll, I'll briefly uh, explain. Um, so when I was preparing for this, um, th this discussion, um, I looked for the first mention as so of uh, climate change and mental health and the link between both in, in UN documents. And I found a report from 2016 of the Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights um, there's on the on the right to the link between climate change and the right to health, uh, and this report states that climate change um, impacts mental health. Um, the impact of mental health stems from the immediate physical effect of climate change and the more gradual effects on the environment, human rights, human systems, and infrastructure, which I think is a very good uh, point to note. Um, and this report also noted that emergency response needs to be comprehensive and cover a broad range of areas such as mental health, sexual and reproductive health, disabilities, etc. Um, I think there's been quite some progress on the awareness on this issue. Um, just to state one fact, um, the Human, the Human Development Report uh, of last year, 2022, highlighted for the first time had a dedicated chapter on mental health, which I think is quite some progress. Um, compared to just one mention a few years ago to now having entire chapters on how to address mental health. And this chapter um, in last year's reports uh, highlights not only the role of climate change in mental health, but also the inequalities in accessing mental health um, throughout the world in terms of different countries, but also within the countries, different, different um, social economic um, uh, uh, levels. Um, so I think th this approach of direct and indirect impact is quite interesting, especially for us who also have a very big mandate to work on crisis prevention and peace building. Um, regarding the direct effect of impact on mental health, we have had um, some our country offices who have led um, initiatives on that. Uh, I'll just mention two. One is our Barbados office, um, and I think Sandeep that links very well with your intervention in the Caribbean. Um, that in February um, this year released the report on youth views on the environment and mental health. And I think the main points are um, completely uh, in line with whatever, all everything you've, you've, you've presented. Um, I'll just state three elements from the report uh, that's uh, roughly half, 51% of the respondents stated that in the um, uh, climate change impact negatively the mental health. That's the elements, the, the, the what they were most anxious and concerned about were um, uh, hurricanes, storms, droughts, and water shortages. And 81% of the respondents stated that interacting with the natural environments positively impacted their mental health. And I think that's a link that throughout the reports on environment and mental health, that's something that comes up that's being in contact with our environments really supports mental health objectives. Um, another example that we have from our country offices is our country office in Bangladesh, who has started uh, mental health sessions for uh, communities to um, to uh, provide to uh, community members uh, strategies and, and techniques to build resilience and psychosocial resilience 
um, in their day-to-day -day struggle with the impacts of natural disasters and with uh, what I think is now pretty much accepted as climate anxiety. And I think that's something that eventually um, is going to be something that will be mainstream throughout um, the policy spectrum. I think this kind of intervention addressing the, the, the anxiety about mental health and the effects of uh, climate change directly as, as a mental health issue directly. Um, my other point that I wanted to make is um, the indirect effects of mental health. Um, so we know already that climate change impacts mental health but um, directly, but also that it changes um, the political dynamics and the conflict dynamics. Um, and that is a very critical point for us. Um, as in many places, we have already we can already see climate change as a destabilizing factor and a trigger for conflict. Um, and basically, I think it links really, really well with Gary, your your point on and your your organization's goal to work on resilience. Basically, we've noticed that um, climate change weakens mental health and overall the resilience of communities to crisis. Um, that can be done. That is being done through disrupting traditional ways of life through putting pressure on existing resources, through triggering food insecurity, but also creating, for example, displacements. Um, I think there's also a report of the uh, special reporter of the OHCHR on um, human rights in the context of climate change that stated in 2021, there were around 60 million internally displaced people across the world, um, 59.1 to be more precise, and most were um, displaced due to climate related disasters which is a higher number than the ones they space to armed conflict. So I think the trend is definitely already there. And all of those have direct impact on mental health. Um, to give you four different um, angles to it and data, um, WHO report from 2022 highlights the impact of climate-related hazards on interpersonal relations and on intimate partner violence, um, as well as on separ family separation and disconnection from um, social support systems, which for us have been a long, long studied uh, major drivers for conflict. Um, another report from the German Environment Agencies, uh, Agency from 2020 highlights um, climate change as a driver, um, as the exacerbating the drivers of existing conflicts and describes it as a threat multiplier, which I think is a very good term for all these indirect effects of climate change on mental health of communities through the disruption, let's say, of, of current ways of life and economic and political systems. Um, just two more. Um, there's a report from the Institute of Economics and Peace, um, which is called the Ecological Threat Report, that mentions that six of the 10 countries in the Sahel that face extremely high or high risk from ecological threats, um, including water resources and food scarcity, correlates with vulnerability to terrorism. And even more clearly, and I think that's the clearest data that that's, um, goes in line with that, is the recent uh, UNDP report, Journey to Extremism, Violent Extremism in Africa, which was released earlier this year in February, um, according to which 51% of recruits in Niger that have been interviewed cited climate change related difficulties as one of the main reasons for joining violent extremist groups. So I think the data is pretty clear that uh, climate change is a threat multiplier and weakens really the, the resilience of communities as well as the mental health. So for us at UNDP and specifically the Crisis Bureau, we've been working on integrating MHPSS in peace building um, for quite some time already with the premise, uh, the quite evident based premise that violence, of course, a crisis, a war impacts people's mental health. But that also means that building the resilience and the mental health of people and communities um, helps them build resilience to crisis. And basically, we need mental health to, pre to help prevent and recover from, from, from crisis and from uh, conflicts. And we've developed a quite exhaustive um, guidance, note, guidance note on how to integrate MHPSS in peace building interventions that I will post in the chat in a bit. Um, we also have now 25 country offices throughout the world in all five continents that work on integrating these MHPSS interventions um, into existing peace building frameworks and interventions. And also we're building a pool of experts uh, in the domain with uh, NOAA. We have around 115 experts on uh, our roster to work on mental health. Um, so we also have just a brief overview on the, the type of 
uh, MHPSS interventions. Um, so they apply to a lot of contexts, whether post-conflict, for areas, trust building, such as Bosnia, Herzegovina, uh, but also working with returnees from um, associated with, it, with former violent extremist groups like in Iraq and Central Asia. So what does it tell us regarding climate change as a trigger and a multiplier, a threat multiplier for conflicts? It tells, I think, two things, that the need for MHPSS will increase from all the, the impact that you've already mentioned, uh, better than I did, on uh, the situations of individuals and communities and the direct impact on their mental health. But also, we know already that the climate change through, through this, this indirect impact, through its disruption of existing political and economic systems, will also create a much a bigger need for mental health um, in terms of conflict prevention and recovery in the areas that are vulnerable to climate change. So I think from our side, there's really a recommendation to, of course, include MHPSS provision in climate change prevention, in adaptation strategies to climate change, to include it in provision, um, MHPSS, MHPSS provision in disaster risk reduction and recovery plan, but also to include um, to address climate change and mental health with a conflict analysis approach to plan for the upcoming needs in terms of MHPSS um, that will be the indirect ones of climate change in terms of changing systems, in terms of displacements, in terms of conflict prevention and recovery, um, and all these needs that will be um, that can be anticipated and will need to be addressed. Thank you. Back to you, Gary. All right. Thanks so much, Jan. Um... So, uh, you know, I uh, put in the chat uh, the link to, uh, link to the most recent UNDP Human Development Report, um, which I would say even more than a chapter, I mean, the whole thing uh, seemed to really be about what, you know, it called, um, uh, and I quote, a global threat to um, mental well-being and, um, and traced it very, very carefully from both its individual effects to societal effects. Um, and impairing, again, not just causing more public health burden and suffering and um, illness, but but making it hard for societies to tackle the big problems now in front of us. And so um, it it really gets to what you're saying. Uh, and I, offer, I also, just a reflection, find it interesting from, I mean, there's the harm side, right, that these conflicts and climate pressures, et cetera, are just, are just pounding away and, and beating beating whole societies up socio and emotionally. Um, but a lot of those root cause problems also have psychological um, strengthening solutions. Because when I look at, you know, I mentioned briefly like this core synthesis of capabilities for people uh, uh, that come out of, if you just look at the whole mass of psychological literature on prevention and promotion, of not only people, but of whole communities, a couple of key psychological capabilities come out as highly um, um, relevant in, in assuring those positive outcomes at the community and individual level. Things like psychological flexibility, empathy, perspective taking, um, all these things are psychological building blocks that I see pop up in the sustainable peace literature, you know, in um, um, you know, other, you know, early childhood development, I mean, in UNICEF, work by UNICEF, which actually included, well, how, how can early child development contribute to peace? There's such of these overlaps that rest on um, psychological strengthening that um, are now sort of converging in uh, the climate space to be more urgent about, um, um, you know, making it a habit of us to strength, to constantly be strengthening. Sure, may I just add something on that? Please. Sure. So when I was I was preparing this intervention, that's also what I thought. That's basically we we have a very peace building approach. And I think, you know, now we can't work on peace building without taking into account all these changes that come from climate change. We can't work in, in vulnerable areas and regions to climate change without taking into consideration how climate change will change the conflicts and the dynamics that are already uh, taking place. But equally, I think we, it's hard now to work on climate change without taking the conflict analysis also in, in place. And when we want to, I think your, your, your mapping of, of New York and the places where to get 
uh, where people can access mental health is very useful. It's a very good approach to kind of try to see where will these needs take place. And that's also harder to do now without taking a proper conflict analysis approach saying climate change is not only impacting people directly through their daily life, it also impacts the dynamics between them and the dynamics between cultural societies and at the political level. So I think both need to be really, the nexus needs to be between um, conflict and security, climate change and mental health. And the three, I think, are becoming increasingly um, intertwined and the harder to kind of differentiate and work on one or two of them without taking the third one into account. Yeah, great. And and look at our host, I mean, Glasswing, um, exemplifying how psychological strengthening not only helps people get through and cope with the emotional damages of violence, but also as an antidote to prevent and um, help undo the cycles of violence. So um, we have to engineer our work as mental health systems and practitioners to be part of the undoing and solution building and not just the caring and um, um, repairing and but both. Um, so uh, Mark, I don't know if you are um, curating or, or watching the um, Q and A or, or that's for us to do, but uh, please, if there are any questions that anyone um, who's been listening uh, have, please um, don't be shy. Uh, for, for any questions or or just thoughts to, and reflections to share with the, with each other in the panel. Okay. Um, well, I will offer another reflection. Um, thinking of you know listening to Sandeep's work um, of this in all policies idea. And, um, you know, I know when I was in New York um, and did the work that led to that map, all of those dots also were opportunities because they were in all these other places to bring in other city agencies. So if we were in, you know, homeless shelters, we brought in the social service agent, you know, department and the police department and the Department of Education, all these places also brought in more of government. And the idea that we could do stuff, we mental health people could do stuff to help some of their outcomes reducing homelessness, increasing graduation rates, et cetera. Um, that's what got them interested. That that made the in-all policies thing not something to have to, you know, philosophically push or make a case, but it was solution um, building or it was an added solution path for all these other sectors. That's how we couched it. And that's how we implemented it. So I was wondering, Sandeep, what you... What you found or are finding as you start to think about resonating and taking on this idea of, you know, putting mental health in the policy water across sectors, what resonates? How does that get traction? Well, what we did actually for the project that we have put forward, and I think Gary, you'll be an advisor on that project, if I'm not mistaken. Sorry about the moving of the screen. Um, that we all 19 governments actually signed up to the project. So in the in, in the CARICOM region, which is the English-speaking Caribbean. So we really hope that we are able to get into those doors, knock on those doors, and ensure that they are able to push this into policy. I did an analysis of manifestos of political parties across the Caribbean, right? And what I found, none had a climate change policy related to health, neither any of them had any direct mental health policy spoken about across their manifestos, right? Now, though I, I may have missed a few because not every manifesto is online, but from those that I have gotten from of the countries, I looked at it because manifestos to me gives a direction and policies that governments intend to take forward. And um, it, it is really um, an area that needs to be strengthened, knocked at those political doors to ensure that they understand this is a problem and something needs to be changed here and make it into their and get it on their radar. Because the worst thing to do is to have all of this information and not be able to get it on the radar of the people that can make change. Um, if those actors are not well oiled, greased and know that this is the way they can perform to deliver and make that tangible change, 
we can have many conferences like these and nothing will happen at the front end. Um, so that's where um, my focus has been. Uh, my focus has been movement building, really trying to get into those rooms where decisions are made to move, move it forward rather than putting out nice reports and research papers. Gary. I think they can also, there's a strong still in many countries, and I, I don't know the, the Caribbean context enough, but I assume that the stigma on mental health is, is still very strong, at least in areas where we work. Um, so I would also think that in political manifesto, that's not something that would appear clearly as, as a subject, because I'm, I'm not sure in many contexts where we work, even with our partners and our government partners, that's something which is considered as um, not that easy to talk about. And, you know, um, so um, I think that's also a big area to work on for everyone. And of course, that's usually something that I see in all the plans regarding mental health and the strategies is addressing stigma. And that's something that we're trying to also do at quite a large scale is just addressing the, the popular stigma around mental health, which is, of course, very contextual and very cultural. But I think it's quite omnipresent wherever we work. Right. And I, and I think a, a, a kind of subtext of a lot of things we were saying on kind of just how interweave mental health is with other social outcomes that we care about and working on that also is a, has multiplier effects on helping us get to those other things, um, including some of the root causes and uh, of climate change, the extractive relationship society, the oppressions, the, the, the inequities, et cetera, that just allow this kind of extractive relationship with nature um, and each other um, to proliferate. Um, and I, I do want to underscore that point that the mental health and climate change area, I often you know, get the feedback, uh, particularly as we as we just get to know communities that we're starting to work with, is, you know, don't, you know, we're resilient. You know, it's hard, but don't make this like armor for us to have to just get by and deal with it. Um, and um, we don't want to send that message that mental health is about, you know, being patched up enough to be able to, you know, just, you know, de deal with it. Um, and we really want to um, embed mental health in these ways, really uh, to include what I call the kind of change side. Um, uh, that that um, climate psychological resilience within climate resilience is part of transformative adaptation, not just coping adaptation, like adaptation that's on defense, right? <laughs> it's like just trying to catch up with the damage and plug it in, but, it, but it's adaptation that means in, in the psychological growth sense of being on offense, of adapting in ways that enable us to collectively seize and name and um, you know, are empowered to act on these problems. So really trying to be careful to position um, you know, uh, the work in that way. Um, I, I think we have to be very mindful of and intentional about. And I think I, I've heard you know, elements of that and what you've both, both been saying. Um, any last comments from the panel? Gary, I just wanted to say something. The only way mental health and climate change will really get to the places where people need to make the meaningful changes when they understand the economics of the situation. And they, they, a lot of people don't understand the health quality of life related issues that are faced and you know really and truly it's a it's a challenge but i think we are getting somewhere and we will work on that gary thanks a million for those for, the, for, for being here thanks yeah and any you. other other comments no or? i think it's it's very interesting i've seen so much change over the last few years especially since covid on awareness on mental health and public discussion on mental health i think it's quite exciting um to, to just answer your, your comments, and I really see exactly what you mean in terms of, you know, we're helping people cope, but is it all we should do, you know, in terms of, um, is that a solution? It's not a solution, right? But it's it's helpful for sure, but that, that's not the only thing we should do. I think it's interesting to see, I think I see more and more um, mental health, like a public good almost, you know, the mental health community is something right. that's, that should come as, as, as a, something to take care of from uh, the policy perspective, for sure. Um, and why not the rights? Um, I have quite some background in human rights and I find it very interesting or um, 
from the UN side, uh, a lot of institutions and the political side has taken a lot of steps to um, mention, as I mentioned, from 2016, there was a brief mention, and now there's an entire part in reports that addresses mental health as like a subject. And I think um, from the, that's very interesting to see how it's coming up also as, as in, in the UN system and in the policy work that we do um, as, as a public good and as a right almost. But we're not yet there, but who knows? Right. Well, Sana, I want to thank you both for joining, um, Jan, for doing it at very short notice, um, and Sandeep, as always. Um, and um, thank you to um, uh, our um, um, uh, moderators, uh, Mark and uh, the team at Glasswing, for pulling off a lot of these yesterday and today. Um, it, it felt really uh, good and, and seamless at our end, so thank you. And everyone else um, uh, who participated and listened, um, I hope this energizes and provokes thinking and, and we appreciate your attention. So everyone else, um, everyone have a good day. Thank you, Gary, Sandeep and team. Thank you. Yeah.